go ahead and open up for some prayer. Heavenly Father, Abba Yahweh, we thank you, Father, for gathering us. We thank you for the safe travel and journey of our beloved Pastor Dallas, Sister Carol, and all the saints who have gathered here, Father. We pray that your spirit comes among us this evening and may give our pastor the utterance here so that the body may be edified. In the mighty, overcoming, victorious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. All right, well, the majority already know who I am, Pastor Dallas. That's my wife, Sister Carol. Um, we're up here making our yearly hiatus, <laughs> as I pronounce it, um, with our brother and sister, uh, Steve and Wendy, and the Saints from Canada up here, uh, who have actually uh, been norms for Paul and Brother Will. And then, of course, the new Israelite family back there. Um, and, of course, Jesse, too. Out here. So I'm look, I'm, what I'm going to do is go ahead and follow after what we have here. It says that Pastor God discusses biblical topics not usually discussed in today's churches, which may include depending on the time, limitations, audience, interest. Number one, who are the chosen people of the Bible, uh, and are you one of them? Uh, number two, looks like what are some of the mistranslations of the Bible? How can we determine what is the true what the true word is? And number three, where are some of the books of the Bible removed? Or why were some of the books of the Bible removed? And then Brother James, Brother Stephen has 1880, King James, 1611 copy of Goods, contains the original book. Does the 1880 have the, um, the Apocryphus in it too? Yes, it does. It does? After uh, 1880, they started taking it all up and uh, they're hard to find. Start gutting it. Gutting it. And actually, uh, I think they've been trying to burn anything that was prior to that because they had the Apocrypha. Ah. All right. Well, let me start off by saying that we, we use um, the King James Version of the Bible mostly out of 1979. And the King James Version of, of the Bible is, is the English Version. Notice it says King James Version. That doesn't mean that King James himself wrote the version. That means that's just his version that he approved of as being king of England at the time. Um, since then, we, it's been, you know, it's done went through many different changes. Uh, because you, you've got many different books uh, or many different cultures out there that have many different books. So say, for instance, the Jewish Bible, the people who are commonly known as Jews today, they have 24 books and only 24 books um, that they actually use in what they commonly call the Scriptures. And, of course, we know the King James Version has 66 books. And then the Catholic Bible has 73 books and then the Ethiopic Scriptures or the Bible has 80 one books. So you can see depending on the culture, where you come from, um, you're going to have certain information presented to you. And it's amazing that coming out of the East that you have 81 books that's presented to you as opposed to the 66 books that's presented to us over here in the West. However, now we do have what we call the best version or the best English version of the scripture that's available to us right now. But the one thing that people need to understand in order to not get offended, because if you become a student of this word and you start continually researching and studying, and sooner or later you're going to run into what is called some inconsistencies in the translations. And this can actually uh, be a detriment to your spirit if you believe that this uh, written word is infallible and is not flawed. It could actually mess you up really good. And the reason why it can mess you up is because a lot of people put a lot of stock in the pensionship of men's hand. Now, while all the prophets, Moses, uh, Abraham, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, etc., 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 while all of the prophets right here were definitely inspired by the Most High God, it is the word that they written down with their own hand um, on whatever it be, parchment, stone, skins, or whatever they had then. It was they that received the engrafted word, the word that was with, that was not tainted. But since then, if you had man's hands in it from different cultures, um, different backgrounds, there's going to be some inconsistencies in these translations. So time ago, I actually went over some of these inconsistencies. And what we do is, uh, bro, Will, you got your Bible right there, right? Yes, what we do is we'll read and then and we'll look at some of the inconsistencies in this. But notice, again. There's no reason to get offended for it. It's just, we just know that man's hand has been on it. 
And why are we going over the different inconsistencies in the King James Version of the Bible? It's just to show you that when one book is translated and it comes down from one culture or one people to another people to, from another culture, and going all the way down to the point where we are now, you're not going to have the same version that was presented to us uh, when the prophets, um, all the only prophets received it. Uh, so there, I don't believe that there was a lick of inspiration under any of the translators. As a matter of fact, I usually refer to them as translators uh, because they have an agenda, which, you know, if you're a student of this, you'll be able to see. For instance, we live in a world now that tries to tell us that the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was Christian. They tried to tell us that the faith of um, all the people that had to do with Christ himself, they were all Christians. And, of course, we know those of us that are students of the book, especially it makes no difference if you go from the old or the new. We all know that neither one of them were, none of the disciples were Christians. Uh, they were all Hebrews, they were all Israelites. And I usually start off by telling people that Abraham was not an Israelite. Abraham was a Hebrew. Uh, Isaac was not an Israelite. He was a Hebrew. The name Israel came into play, because many of you already know, when Jacob had his name changed to Israel after wrestling with the angel of, of the Most High God, which just happened to be Yahshua HaMashiach himself, Jesus Christ. Um, and that means and the word Israel uh, is someone, or the word Hebrew, you put them both together, someone who has passed over. What we're trying to do is in this world, this life, the little small space of time that we have here, is overcome. Sin, hell, and the devil in order to have an expected end. And make no mistake about it, um, there's a reason why that bloodshed has been spilled, uh, that these books end up in our hand. As you can see, you look at the cosmos, look at the people up here in Canada right now, everybody's going to and fro. Nobody's even got a thought of the most high y'all in their mind or in their conscience. Um, they're all religious, I'm sure, very religious in nature, just like they are down in the States. But the majority of people out there that's walking around couldn't even quote you the Ten Commandments, much less two or three scriptures. Because they simply are just not interested in the kingdom of Yah. Most people are in vain are living this life. And you go over here to this side, you see these people in the grocery store and stuff. They're living their life, and it's all about them. And that's why when I did a video earlier today, I quoted uh, Matthew 6.33 that says, Seek ye first the kingdom of Yah and, all, and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. But in this world, in this time of society we're living in now, people are not about seeking y'all, it's about seek me. And that's what people are doing. They're fulfilling the lust of their own flesh. They're not interested in it. But the day of judgment is coming. And then when that day does come, everybody's going to wish then that they had actually not wasted their life being sidetracked by whatever the enemy has used to sidetrack them, be it family, be it job, occupation, or whatever. They're going to wish that they had actually spent more time with the Most High uh, in order to enjoy the benefits of the kingdom to come. Now, we can't determine who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. Um, that's totally up to the most high of Yah. But we can definitely know who he is because they love him and they keep his commandments. Now, with the books in itself, as far as the inconsistency in translation, remember these men were not inspired, but what it does, it gives you a teaching tool to be able to teach others. And so if you have a pen, she's breaking, you probably need to write these down so that you'll be able to use this as a minister to in case somebody ever comes up upon you and, and they read these things in the Bible and then they find out that, wait a minute, this seems like an inconsistency here, then you can go and explain to them that the people who translated the original scriptures, um, there was something going on with them people. I personally believe they had an agenda. I believe they were uh, out to do what they were accomplished to do, and they have set it up. And, and, and i say it again as today, we have a religion that is presented to us, that has become the largest religion in the free world, Christianity. And the book, the Holy Bible, does not give you one instruction to a Christian. It does not give you one rule or guideline for Christians. It does not teach you the commandments that the Most High God was the God of the Hebrews to Christians. So how did we get here? We got here because uh, one nation sacked another nation, sacked another nation, and the reason why Israel is in the condition at the end of the day, the ones who are scattered throughout the world, is because we despised Yah's laws, statutes, and commandments. And since we um, held his commandments in little esteem, he scattered us among the nations, among the heathens and stuff. And, and so now we're very few in number. Uh, we're here in exile, and while being in exile, we're actually going to uh, uh, 
um, see those of us who have a real true heart to actually return back to the law, statutes, and commandments, and then try to pull as many people in this world as we can over to the Most High God. Now, there's only going to be few. It ain't going to be many. You're going to um, look like the all scouring of the earth or, or slow thumb out of joint. And that's just a, a calling that you're just going to have to accept and realize that there's only going to be a few of us that's going to enter in. So, let's go ahead and deal. We're going to be in 2 Kings on the first one right here. Let's go ahead and deal with some of the inconsistencies in translation. It doesn't mean anything wrong with the word, but inconsistencies in translation um, in the King James Version of the Bible, starting in the Old Covenant of the Old Testament. 2 Kings, chapter 24, uh, verse 8. Brother Will, 2 Kings, chapter 24, verse 8. And then we're going to read from there. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll let you go ahead and read that, and I'll get the next one. When you have it, Brother Will, go ahead and read. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. And his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out, of the, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers. And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth, in the eighth year of his reign. Now, when did the king of Babylon uh, take Jehoiakim? The eighth year. The eighth year of what? Of his reign. The eighth year of his reign. Now, let's go to 2 Chronicles 36, verse 9. 2 Chronicles 36. Um, yeah, 2 Chronicles, chapter 36, verse 9. Go ahead and read, Brother Will. Sir. The oil king was eight years old when he began to reign. Now, let me go back over here. Hold what we had right here because we're going back to 2 Kings 24, uh, verse 8. It says Joel king was 18 years old. 18 years old when he began to reign um, in Jerusalem three months. And his mother's name was Methuselah, uh, the daughter of Ethnal of Jerusalem. Is that right? Since 18, okay? Now, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 9 says, And Joel Kim was eight years old when he began to reign. So now the question is, was he 18 or was he 8? You see what I mean? And you need to be able to chain these together right here. Are you following me? So when you read that, you need to know, okay, was he 18 or was he 8? Or does it really matter? It matters to us in time we're going to teach history. But we're just showing you what the, uh, one of the inconsistencies was to show you that man's hand, these people are not inspired like the most high, but we, that we do have enough record here for us to be able to get to the truth concerning the salvation and knowing who we are as a people. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 26. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 26. And when you have it, brother, we'll read. Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. Now what I want you to do is pay attention to the numbers, because that's what we're dealing with right now. He was two and what? Two and twenty years old. He was two and twenty years old when he began to reign. Is that right? Yes, sir. Keep reading. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. All right. Now let's go over to Second Chronicles, where we were earlier, comparing the books, comparing the accounts. Uh, chapter 22, verse 2. And it says, 
Forty and two years was Isaiah when he began to reign. How, how old was he? Forty and two years. Forty and two years. Now, if we go back to 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 26, it gave us that he was what? Twenty-two years old yes, when he began to reign. And then we go to the account of Chronicles, it said that he was 42 years old. So which one was it? See, these are the questions. These are the things that we're going to have to end up knowing. And we have to provide answers so that people don't get offended. Because I've had people read this book and find contradictions, and then they get offended and say, ain't none of the truth, and that's not true. That's why we have to study and show ourselves approved. My suggestion is, so I don't give away everything else, is that behind these words, a lot of these words, if you look behind the English word that is given, see what the Hebrew equivalent was, and then that way you'll be able to know exactly what was what. Amen? All right, 1 Kings, chapter 4. Are y'all getting in? Yes, sir. Are y'all already offended? No, sir. All right, 1 Kings, chapter 4, verse 26. Go ahead and read. And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. He had, a, he had a, how many? 40,000 stalls for his horses. 40,000 stalls for his horses. And 12,000 horsemen. And 12,000 horsemen. Y'all got that right? Pay attention, all right? Second Chronicles, chapter 9. Verse 25. Go ahead and read. And Solomon had 4,000 stalls of horse for his horses and chariots. Did y'all hear? Did you hear the difference? Keep reading. And 12,000 horsemen, whom he bestowed in the chariot cities and with the kings, with the king at Jerusalem. So did he have 40,000 stalls for his horses or did he have 4,000 stalls for his horses? Are y'all getting this? Y'all getting this right? Yes, sir. All right. First Samuel, first Samuel, um, chapter thirty-one, verses four through six, brother Will. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, mm -hmm. Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest thee, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his arm, armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took his sword and fell upon him. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. Now, what do you think that I'm looking for in this right now? Since we're looking for inconsistencies. All right, read it again. Then said Saul to his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through their way, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took his sword and fell upon it. So, who killed Saul? Saul. According to this? Saul. Saul did, right? Saul actually fell upon his own sword. Is that right? Now let's go over here to 2 Samuel. And this will probably make for some uh, good Skype talk, wouldn't it? <laughs> 2 Samuel, chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10 just to get an understanding of the account. Go ahead. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, uh -huh. that David had abode two days in Ziglag. It came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul mm -hmm. with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was, when he came to David, that he fell to the earth and did obe obe obeisance. Uh -huh. And David said unto him, From whence thou comest? And he said unto him, out of the camp of Israel I have escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people are also, are also fallen and dead, and Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. 
And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son be dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount, Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me, and called unto me. And I answered, Here I am. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him, and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head, and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them hither unto my master. All right, so what does this account say? This account say that the Amalekite slew Saul. Is that right? So the question is, which one is it? See, all of this is stuff that really truly needs to be studied and bear it out, um, not only for our sake, because it's inevitable that when you're going to come across people that are interested in the faith and really truly want to know the truth, that they're going to run across these. No doubt about it, and they're going to have questions. And we need to have the answers uh, for them. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 10, Brother Will, verse 18. And the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots. Of uh, how Syrians, many chariots? 700 chariots. 700 chariots. Of the Syrians, and 40,000 horsemen, and smoke showback the captain of their host, who died there. All right, now let's go to First Chronicles, chapter 19, verse 18. Now, we got David, 7,000 chariots, right? And 40,000 horsemen of the Assyrians, is that right? Read on. But the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men, which fought in chariots. Now, remember the first account said 700. This one said 7,000. Read on. And 40,000 footmen, and killed Shopak, the captain of the host. So the question is, is, was it horsemen or was it footmen? Which one was foot soldiers? Which one was it? So, all, you all understand this, right? Y'all get this, right? Okay. Now, to deal with the, the ancient one or the one everybody's familiar with over here, let's go over here to the book of the Action. The book of Actions or the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12. And we're going to start at the very first verse for understanding sake, understanding purposes. And we're going to read on down to verse 4. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James the brother of John with the sword. Mm -hmm. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Okay, we all know that these were the days of unleavened bread. This ought to be the, of one of the feasts of Israel, one of the major feasts of Israel. And he's telling you this was the time frame that all this was taking place. All right? These were the days of unleavened bread. However, we have something that the translators has done, which simply just doesn't make sense, since those of us that are Israelites and understand the covenant and understand the feast days, when it says these were the days of unleavened bread, that that's a particular time frame. All right? So the days of unleavened bread is not the same as the pagans have today. They, they used to be at two opposite ends of the calendar, but it seems like, according to last year, they're starting to close the gap a little bit. And it's just utterly amazing. So read on verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him before quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, it says Easter, but of course the Greek number 3957, when you look at that word Easter, it's presented Easter in English, but behind it is the Greek translation of it, which is Pesca, which is a name for Passover. So Easter is not another name for Passover. Yet and still, the translators put this in there. And of course, if people see Easter in there, guess what people are going to do today? 
They're going to assume, hey, Easter's in the Bible. We should be celebrating this stuff. But Easter is nothing more than a, a pagan um, fertility worship from the goddess Ishtar or Istarte. Now, when we look at these wonders right here, we see all these people. You know how I many of these people probably go to church every Sunday and probably just got finished hunting Easter eggs and everything else all this year? Believing that they're obeying the laws and statutes and commandments, believing that they're obeying what Jesus said, but in total deception, they're actually going against what Christ has said. He says in John 14, 15, if you love me, then you're going to keep my commandments. He teaches us that if, I, if his word abide in us, and then we would do exactly what he was what he says. He says if the person that is a liar is the one that is an antichrist. And so what we have is we have a religion sitting in front of us that has actually swept the whole entire world. And the whole world believes it because they say Jesus. They say the name, but in function, in works, they actually deny him. The Bible, they teach Christmas, Easter, Sunday, uh, Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, Independence Day, all these other days. And not one of these days can you find a festival or a holy commandment for us to be actually keeping, be you, if you name yourself a Christian, Jew, Israelite, or whatever it is. If you're going to have this book in your hand, you can't justify the lies that have been promoted today. So, we're in some serious trouble. Some very serious trouble. We understand the trouble we're in because we've been in this for a while. We've been preaching and teaching this for a while. And the idea is, is to use these truths uh, that we have here to order, in order to wake up those who want to be woken up. But I would tell you this. A lot of people out there really, truly have no desire whatsoever at all to actually be set free. John 8, 32 says, you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But Galatians 4, 16 says, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth. So it's telling you clearly that you're going to become people's enemies when you're telling the truth. The man that lived, the Messiah, that came down from glory, did not commit one sin against mankind. All he did was heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils, healing all that were oppressed of the devil for y'all was with him, and he got him impaled on a tree, or what they call commonly killed and hung on a cross. That's what the, um, the pagans, what the heathens would say today. And it's a sad situation because I've actually came to the conclusion that all these religions of the world, especially Christianity, is actually the strong delusion that the Apostle Saul has spoken to us about over in the book of Thessalonica. Because he said that God would send a strong delusion that people would believe a lie and not the truth. And the reason why they would believe this lie, the purpose is, is for them so they can be damned. Because they had no pleasure in the truth, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, people simply just don't have enough time to care about what the Most High says. They don't have enough time to uh, put down their life and, and to sacrifice their life for what the Most High has said and done himself. It would be one thing if y'all were sitting up there in glory, giving us law, statutes, and commandments, and telling us exactly what we need to be doing. Um, and then he himself not experienced this actual walk here on the earth himself. But that's exactly what he did. He became a man. He became a man, came down here, removed all the excuses from us to let us know that this thing can't be done. So Satan has done a good job, and he just about got it all complete by turning his whole world upside down. Now what we're looking at now is we're watching, I'm sure y'all have it up here in Canada as well. Um, we have people, um, uh, I think they're challenged in their mind wondering who they are 20 and 30 years after birth, you have having men um, turning into women. And you have having women turning into men. I just got finished seeing two women holding hands right here. So y'all have the same sickness and the same epidemic that we have in the United States. Uh, homosexuals um, up here as we do down there. And it's just a sad situation that's going on because iniquity is abounding. And because iniquity is abounding, the love of men is waxing cold. And things are not going to get better. We're only going to go from bad to worse until it's time for the king. The one thing I wanted to discuss, um, and I wanted to make sure I put this and rehearse this in our ears again, is that we know that we're in the end day. And we have a lot of people out here, a whole bunch of people out here. Uh, everybody wants to try to make predictions. 
Everybody want to try to, you know, uh, do what they call their part, or, you know, Jesus is coming, or the end is near, and all this stuff. What we need to be looking for is we need to be looking for those people who are willing to put their neck out on the line and say, thus saith Yahweh, or thus saith the Lord. If they're not saying that, all they are is false prophets and noisemakers. Because then we would have the rules and the guidelines to be able to go by that tells us if any man start prophesying and his prophecy don't come to pass, what does it tell us that we, we could do if we was in our own home front and homeland? Stone we could stone to death. We sure could. Do you think they will put the silence and, and make these mouths stop if people start dying for false prophecy and misleading people today? But because nobody is saying, thus saith Yahweh, people get up and speculate. They can continue to keep preaching lies and teaching lies. And because the people are, are dumb, down to an unprecedented level, they don't even want to read this book. They have no interest in this book. They don't even know a deceiver comes when a deceiver is sitting right in front of them. So what they do is they insulate themselves and they protect themselves by giving out speculation. And who knows, maybe out of about one of these 50 prophecies, these false prophecies that they have, they may just get it. And then if they do get one out of 50, you better believe they're going to exalt to the Zena that one that they got and have everybody to focus on that one. And forget about the 49 that was already, that was already lied about when they uh, didn't say, thus say the Lord in the first place. So even though they don't say it, their words, if they are putting their neck out there and they're sticking their neck out there and saying this is going to take place and this is going to take place, and if it don't come to pass when it comes to biblical prophecy, then these people are false prophets. They're false prophets and false teachers. All right. With that said, I went over that a little bit right here. We already know a little part about biblical Israel. Um, and we went over the books that was removed. Um, well, we didn't go over the books that was removed. Um, but I'm sure you're familiar with some of the books. Has anybody ever come across the book of Gad? Heard of it anywhere? Whatsoever at all? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's written in here, and I can't find the thing, and, I, and you can look all over the place. You know, you can come up with different versions of Enoch, or what it's commonly called, Henoch. We have those and Jubilees. Um, we got quite a few of them, and the books of the Apocrypha, the hidden books. But the one that seems to keep eluding us is getting. Now, I know all these books are. Y'all know what they got? No, you got that right. They're sitting up there in the Vatican, and, and they ain't going to give us access to them. I promise you that. Um... But I know that the Most High uh, was generous and kind enough, to, regardless of what man has done, to leave us a record for us to continue to keep digging and searching and finding out. And who knows, before long, we'll just unearth and continue to keep unearthing more truth until the King comes. But every truth that we come to, it's all for our benefit. No matter how minute or how small you may think it is, it's all for our benefit, uh, especially those of us who are going to be ruling in the kingdom to come. So we definitely have something to look forward to. Um, what I do here, just for a few minutes, I don't want to keep everybody long. What I'll do for a few minutes is ask, is there any questions that y'all have in your hearts about anything in reference to the Bible or maybe even current or world events? It makes, any, it makes no difference to me. Which one? Anybody have any questions about anything? Yes, ma'am. I heard one time that there was uh, something about the Bible that was written by a Christian that wasn't really along the lines of. A what kind of book? A book of herbs, medicinal herbs mm -hmm. that. that uh, Noah had on board the ark. Have you heard about that? No, ma'am. Um, one of the apocryphal books. Have you heard of that? What's that? A book of medicinal healing book. Or a book of herbs. All the herbs that you needed to be healed. I've heard of the herbs. Right. He talks about the herbs of the field for the service of man. Exactly in the book itself. But I wouldn't, you know, there's so much that has definitely been lost. Um, you look at the, the pharmaceutical industry definitely don't want the competition of their natural herbs. If you um, take the alloy plant, alloy mm -hmm. plant, that's a healing plant. Right, and correct. Burns and all that sort of stuff to heal. Mm -hmm. You take that that came from the parts of Israel, the Jewish part, or the desert, wherever it came from. There are a lot of those type of plants out there which pharmaceuticals don't want you to know about. Right, correct. And of course there is a book out there, but I don't know the name of it, but I've heard of it, and my wife's a nurse, and she tells me there are medicines that the medical society knows about, right. but they won't tell you. Exactly. So, 
it would be interesting to find out where it is and where it comes from. She tells me every once in a while, she worked at McMaster University, that's in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. That is a huge place where all the doctors of the world come for a year tender, like premature baby, whatever it is. Right. And I worked there one time. I've never seen uh, a place that has so much technology. If they got stuff in there that they don't tell the public. So it's probably available to kings, queens, monarchs, all Probably of because right now in Hamilton, because I was raised in Hamilton, the steel coming was a huge industry. Mm -hmm. It failed. Mm -hmm. McMaster started out years ago. Now they have that whole area from Hamilton right down to Toronto, right down to Windsor, over 14,000 people working for them in different areas. Mm -hmm. So the technology of this medicine is rampant, but they don't tell you. And my wife said, everyone's supposed to come up with a name. She said, this is the thing that will cure. But they won't tell you where it is. And y'all know the reason why, right? You can't control a healthy population. You can only control a sick population. And that's the reason why they don't want it out. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to unearth, you know, there's so much wisdom and knowledge in the graves now. It, it's any wonder that we're able to come to, you know, with the Praying to the Most High, asking Him to reveal to us and give us wisdom, knowledge, understanding. That's one reason why that He gave us Jesus. That's one reason why He gave us Jesus and divine healing, uh, because of a lot of these things that we no longer have access to. That's where the power of the Holy Spirit can actually come in. But even in that, y'all have to understand, we live in the West. It's a whole lot more easier for me to preach in the East than it is in the West. You can see more divine miracles taking place over there than not ever over here because we have too many distractions. We just simply are not as strong and rich in faith as the people in the East are. That's just a fact. Um, we become religious. They have, uh, they have faith and we have money. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just a bad trade-off. I mean, have you ever heard in the Bible about Melchizedek? Yes, sir. You ever read up on him? And only what has been revealed in the Bible. I learned recently that Melchizedek was Shem, the son of Noah. Mm -hmm. And when Abraham went to him, he gave him 10% of the offering. Mm -hmm. And he was actually, he was representing the Most High God. Mm -hmm. and lots of people say, well, there was no beginning. And he, wasn't, he, he wasn't born and he didn't die. Well, when I got into the Hebrew context, it said in those days, they didn't have any genealogy. They didn't register. Mm -hmm. So he was human. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what it says in the book. Yeah. So it's interesting to see that he was the son of Noah. I've heard that theory before. I'm going to call it a theory. Yeah. I've heard that theory before because uh, even when it talks about uh, uh, the Son of Man or the angel of the Most High, Yah, everybody automatically knows it's talking about Jesus. You know, we already know of Yahshua. Um, I've heard that before, but. Uh, and most people think that it was the king himself uh, that was actually Melchizedek. Or he about was, the, king of, or he Melchizedek. was the king of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, Melchizedek was the king of Jerusalem. He was the king. Jerusalem was a small place. Right. And he was the king. They and saw, where, where, where is this book that you get these sources from? I went into the computer and got onto the Hebrew scriptures. Mm -hmm. And I got copies of it, of all the stuff. Like Noah, Daniel, uh, all these prophets. Mm -hmm. If you go into the computer and look under the under the names, you get on the Hebrew scriptures. They give you all the information. Did y'all hear that? Yeah, it's interesting because when I read that, I was oh my gosh. When you read the book Melchizedek, you think, well, this guy's from heaven. He wasn't. He was from earth. Mm -hmm. And it tells you exactly explains to you where he came from, who his father and mother was, and everything. I think it's Book of Joshua that uh, says he's the son of Shem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Shem. Okay, now that's good information. Now, what is the purpose of the information? Me? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just saying there's a lot in the books that we don't hear about. Exactly. And we don't read about it. We just read the Bible and we close it and we're sort of closed-minded because my father was quite the businessman and he taught me you research. Exactly. Don't quit. 
-hmm. And then you come out and you close the book and you go, well, I don't know nothing. Because <laughs> I just learned something which I obviously assume something different. Exactly. Right? You're correct. That's what you said about knowledge and telling the people. Mm -hmm. So how can I preach and teach on it if I don't know what I'm talking about? Exactly. That's the truth. And that's, that's my safety too. I make sure that I know a subject very, very good before I actually explore it, I actually teach it because I don't want people to actually, uh, you know how it is, it's easy for people to get offended today. You know what I mean? And take it, wah, 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 even though they're not doing too much themselves to try to further their education concerning these scriptures right here. But they are harsh judges, very harsh, harsh judges um, for us as the people. And it's just a sad, sad situation. So, with this, you know, and having the spirit of truth, then it's not hard for us. See, it's easy for us to preach this among ourselves because we're already believers. But it's another thing when you get outside of the confines of us and head out there into this world where Christ said that we would be um, as sheep among wolves. As sheep among wolves. Uh, what is the dominant religion up here in this area right here? Christianity is the dominant religion. And so with that being the dominant religion, what is the dominant flavor? Meaning either Pentecostal, Apostolic, Catholic, Methodist. I would have to say Roman Catholic would be probably the most dominant. This is uh, a few years ago, the Pentecostal had a Bible conference here, mm -hmm. uh, like the university. Yes, sir. Which is very powerful. I think they sold it, didn't they? Are you aware of that? So, huge. So basically, there are a lot of Pentecostal churches up here. Matter of fact, this whole area is very Christianity. Mm -hmm. It's called like the Bible Belt of Southern Ontario. Okay. There's a lot of Christian church, Christian victory, Pentecostal, Pentecostal. There's a lot around I can show you that are Christian churches. Yeah, there are Roman Catholics, but in a lot of Baptist churches. So this is basically a hub. Mm -hmm. for Christianity in this area. It's strong. Okay, so my question is, is going to this. So since this is the hub for Christianity, it's very strong, and no doubt there's a lot of Pentecostals up here. You know, y'all say that the true worshipers are the ones that's going to worship him in spirit and in truth. And he said that when you have his spirit, his spirit will lead you and it will guide you into all truth. So what we have today is we have a section of people who have either the spirit and no truth, or either they have the truth and no spirit. And we know that God hates a false balance. So, with the people who say they claim that they have the, the Ruach HaKadosh or the Holy Spirit, would not that spirit lead and guide them into all truth the same way that he is doing with us? I think that he would if they were his. So, I know it's a bold statement. I'm thinking that only a few people actually really truly read, receive his spirit, and a lot of these religions are receiving a familiar spirit. Some that's familiar because it's not bringing the people to the truth that sets free. Does that make sense? All right. Is there any more questions or statements? Brother Will. Um, I know the, the Bible says that the last day's knowledge will increase, and I know that you mentioned the book of Gad. Do you believe that all these books that have been hidden to us will be revealed to us before Messiah comes back? That's my own personal opinion. I'm hoping so. And I'll tell you the reason why. There used to be a time that all of us, we never even knew, even though we had the Bible, we never knew about the book of the Apocrypha. And look at the blessing that is brought upon us just by simply reading these books right here. We're able to bridge the gap of history between Malachi and Matthew we're able to understand the mindset of the nations today and where they get their doctrines and their theologies from. And not only that, now we can see that here in this Western Hemisphere that these people have every intention, just like King Antiochus did, of making everybody a one people. But in order to do that, and notice they're out of religion today. You notice the moral decay, the spiritual decline that we're all experiencing right now, where there's no absolutes. Everybody do what you want to do, feel what you want to feel, and believe what you want to believe. All that is going on today. And there's no, no conviction whatsoever at all. And Satan has just about got the people right where he wants them. Because the Bible says, when he comes, will he find faith on this earth? And so we have this book right here that told us, that clearly say, hey, 
they're going to try to do whatever they can to get all these people under the laws of a particular government. And what has, what has ever happened in history before is happening again. But we, in exile, okay, we know that we were probably, some of us born in Canada, we're Canadians, born in America, we're Americans. But our first allegiance, first allegiance belong to the kingdom. We're a child of the king first. And the king expects us to exalt his laws and statutes and commandments above that of man. But today, because people operate out of the fear of man, they exalt their laws and their statutes, in essence, showing who their Elohim or who their God is. So when he said to Joshua a long, long time ago, choose you this day whom you go serve, the same choice and decision is still left on our plate, right in front of us every single day. So who are you going to serve? Um, Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. All right. If there's nothing else, then I'm going to go ahead and conclude then, all right? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all things. We thank you for the blessings that allowed us to be able to come up here to visit our families, to be able to speak the words, the truth, and pray to these saints see deep down in our hearts. Continue, Lord. We need you, Father, to help inspire me by the videos that you allow me to put out to wake up the masses of the people, to inspire the saints. We thank you for bringing these Israelites over the roads, over the highways, um, and spending some time with them, um, with our family, that we so yearn and long to see continuously. I plead the blood over each and every last one of them as well as us and the saints of Straightway and all the saints that are associated and affiliated with Straightway that you will watch over them lead and guide them. Help us, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We lose holy angels to give us a safe journey back to our destination of where we lay in our heads tonight. Encourage the hearts of your people. Light a fire up on us even more so so that you will find faith on this earth when you come. We bless your magnificent, wonderful name. We thank you for the sacrifice and our names written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. In the mighty name of Yahshua, Amen. 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 All right. Shalom, saints. Boy, y'all quiet. Thank you, sweet quiet. Brother Steve Menorah. 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 Well, thank you for coming. Shalom, saints. It's Brother Ugly here. And uh, it's a beautiful day. The Northern Tribe have gathered. Uh, our beloved Pastor Charles Dowell and his wife, Sister Carol, have come up to visit the Saints in Canada. And we've got some new Saints uh, joining the Assembly this year, or at least interested in, in the straightway truth. So we're thankful. We're having a beautiful day here uh, up in Buckhorn, and the Saints are just, uh, you see, doing what Saints do best when we're not at work. And we're just fellowshipping, enjoying one another's company. It's, it's absolutely, it's just crazy. And sometimes I wonder, it's like, am I letting that into me? I try to get beyond it. Who you are. And, and, and then every time, I, 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 do, I'm a I told Brother Chris every, from, from Kansas City, he's like, I'm going to be there when he does it. Yeah. And there's Brother Will. Welcome back to Canada, Brother Will. I'm glad to be here again. Always a blessing to have you here. Yes, sir. And our host, Brother Steve. Thank you always uh, for opening your door to us so we have somewhere to gather. Anything for family. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. We, uh, we trade right up from blood to spirit. Spirit's going to rule in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you again. Bless you, Brother Steve. Thank you, Brother. Yeah. We have the rest of the crew. understand what you're up against and it changed your attitude. People. If you notice a lot of my videos, I have people that will come against me one way or the other. They'll say certain things, and I'll quickly say, I agree with you, but that's your opinion. I agree with you having your opinion. Um, it's your perspective. You can have that. But I'm also entitled to mine. And since I'm entitled to mine, and you're listening to me, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> you understand what I mean? But when you have a knowledge of self, and you know who you are, um, that makes all the difference in the world all the difference in the world, right, Vaughn? Because then you won't be affected, because I tell you right now, I live in a racist county. But it's a soft form of racism, because they'll never admit it. The, 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 the few little things that take place is mo mostly by, you know, little teenagers. I'm aware of that. You know what I mean? Adults ain't got time for that stuff. They don't do that stuff. You understand what I mean? And, and it's mostly about teenagers or something like this who have getting gassed up on a few things. But they never do anything to actually injure or harm because they already know the type of man I am and the brother at the community. You understand what I mean? So 
notice this. Anytime somebody has any type of vendetta, be it personal or physical, that's conducive to that person. Now, you follow me? That's their personal problem. You don't have to make their problem your issue. Are you getting that? Yeah. Yeah, brother, you choose to function that way. Hey, have fun. I hope it makes you happy. You understand what I mean? But with me, nah, man, I'm going to keep myself clear, man. You understand what I mean? It's, 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 it's them. Yes. It's their little circle, their sphere. Yeah. That's your world. Yeah. And if you choose to be that way, it's going to actually hurt you more. It's going to hurt me being that way. You understand what I mean? You get it? So rest in knowing that people are going to be who they're going to be, and that's the choice and decision they make. The only time it becomes problems and trouble to you is when they begin to infringe upon your rights. Until then, as long as they keep their distance, have your attitude, have your feelings, have your emotions, and we're on the job. You keep it professional, because I'm not here to get along with you. You're not here to get along with me, and know who your enemies are, because you do have enemies. Your enemies make it quite known when they look at you with the color of your skin, you know the enemy. And when you know who your enemies are, then you know who the friend and not the friend, and that way you can keep yourself in the love of y'all, and you can keep them at bay to make sure that you don't allow them close to you to injure you. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's one of my... Uh, False, I think it's one of my blind faults because because of that I put up a lot of barriers and it takes me a very long time to really get close to people. Good. So, you know, I have very few close friends. Like, you know, I might have like two friends that might know some things about Sister Hun and Brother Hun Bun. Yeah. <laughs> Shalom. Shalom. You know, that's, uh, wait until the father comes by and calls you. Hunt I'm ready for it. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're going to get some nice, refreshing cold spring water.